So it's a great pleasure to introduce the final speaker for this meeting. It's Paul Hytjens from the University of Hanover. I've known him for a very long time and he's always produced very thorough, very meticulous work, mainly with NMR on ionic materials. And I'm sure we're going to have a nice talk to end the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan, for this uh, nice introduction. Before I start, I would like to thank the organizers, in particular Christoph and his really excellent team, um, for this uh, organization and also, of course, for inviting me. Well, the title is Mobile Lithium and Fluorine Ions, the two most light ions, the cation besides uh, hydrogen and anion um, in insulating materials. And I think I'll take you a little bit apart from the main um, topic of this conference, which is insulating materials, um, because as a kind of introduction, let's have a look at this conductivity landscape here, where the electronic conductivity is plotted versus the ionic conductivity. And we are very low, uh, low here in this area, insulators, dielectrics, and electrolytes. And we are going to cover uh, the abscissa in this uh, area from uh, slow motion to fast motion. Well, the motivation for uh, studying ion dynamics and diffusion is, of course, uh, at the moment, a very hot topic, which is uh, these lithium ion batteries, schematically shown here. Uh, we have the uh, cathode, we have the anode, and in particular, we have the electrolyte. Uh, and uh, it would be very helpful to have solid electrolytes. Here is a, a kind of uh, scenario of the present and future scenarios of lithium batteries. Uh, and the time scale you see here is that at least in the next decade, uh, lithium ion batteries will be a very prominent uh, 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 energy uh, storage system uh, for for um, autom automotive and, of course, also for portable electronics. And more, more, uh, more and more solid electrolytes will become important, uh, for example, due to safety aspects. But also uh, fluorine batteries, their first attempt to pro produce fluorine batteries, and uh, here is uh, just the cover uh, of uh, a journal, excuse me, um, by uh, the Fichtner group. And uh, well, of course, well, we have these redox uh, reactions at the cathode and, and the anode. But on the other hand, uh, what is uh, more interesting for me and my group are the fundamentals of these uh, uh, the aspects of diffusion mechanisms, for example, dimensionality effects, and <clears throat> in particular also the influence of structural disorder. And all this is uh, studied in a, a DFG research unit in Hanover, uh, which is called Molife. Here is schematically the uh, the connection between microscopic parameters like the jump rate and uh, macroscopic parameters like the diffusion coefficient or the conductivity. Of course, the activation energy is important and uh, sometimes you may be able to study the, the jump geometry. Uh, here's just a schematic representation of the light motifs of this research group uh, subdivided 
and phenomena, materials, methods, and of, of course also theory is involved. I want to go to, into the details. We will see examples in the following for this. Um, Christoph asked me to uh, do some tutorial also. Uh, so let me just remind you, we have uh, microscopic and macroscopic diffusion quantities. We all, I just mentioned also already the jump rate, which is related <clears throat> via the einstein smolokovsky relationship to the tracer diffusivity. R is the jump distance. F is a correlation factor which tells you whether the diffusion is random or not. Uh, this diffusivity, on the other hand, is related to the conductivity. Well, of course, the ionic conductivity and uh, with the ionic density, the charge, and the Haven ratio, ratio which also is something like a, a correlation factor. Of uh, most cases, the temperature dependent is described by an Arrhenius relation. And the activation energy, uh, which is maybe astonishing for most people, is not, is not a real material constant. It depends on the time window of your method. Uh, the, the, the time window uh, with, with which uh, you study the process uh, will result in different, what, what may be then apparent activation energy, but, uh, but they have to be interpreted in different ways. We'll see that. Um, <clears throat> also, as maybe as a kind of tutorial, uh, some experimental um, remarks. Um, according to the uh, quantities, um, we have uh, uh, microscopic and macroscopic. We have uh, uh, methods which we call may call microscopic and macroscopic. And there's this rook in the here in the microscopic uh, method. There is this group of NMR techniques, very 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 uh, quite a bunch of NMR techniques like relaxation line shape, spin alignment, echo exchange, and a little bit exotic also, beta radiation detected NMR. I will um, uh, mention that in also in a minute, but also quite exotic like muon spin relaxation, uh, not so exotic, quasi-elastic neutron scattering. And on the other hand, macroscopic, uh, also, uh, you may study uh, the macroscopic diffusion coefficient by field gradient NMR, you uh, probably know. And, um, of course, also radioactive tracer normally. But our favorite uh, uh, ions here are lithium and fluorine, and there is no radioactive tracer for that. Mass tracer is, is of course, possible. And also, uh, neutron reflectometry is becoming more and more important for very slow uh, motions. Um, you may measure the conductivity by impedance spectroscopy. On the, on the other hand, on, on the one hand, uh, if you uh, are interested in macroscopic transport, you uh, measure the DC conductivity. If you are interested in microscopic uh, motion in jumps, you study AC conductivity up to very high frequencies. Uh, ideally, ideally uh, to frequencies which go up in, into the NMR range, uh, it means megahertz, uh, so then you can study the same process with different techniques. Uh, here are ranges of diffusivities and jump rates, uh, in particular of uh, NMR techniques, as compared to others, the NMR techniques are essentially in red. And you see the range um, of jump rates go from about 10 to the 10, which is near the melting point. We are talking of about solids, of course, uh, down to very slow motion, where only every uh, 
hundred seconds or uh, um, even more, there's one jump of an, of an ion. And uh, correspondingly, the diffusion coefficients are given here. And uh, the different techniques cover all these, uh, uh, this, this huge range. And of course, it's important to combine and uh, to, uh, to study uh, or to use these different techniques in order to get a complete picture. Um, let's turn to the uh, solid state NMR technique. I think you probably know um, these effects. I just recall them. Uh, you can, may study uh, microdynamics and diffusion via uh, NMR line narrowing, which is the, uh, the oldest uh, technique. Then uh, spin lattice relaxation uh, is either done in the laboratory frame or in the rotating frame. Uh, and this is sketched here. The spin lattice relaxation rate plotted on a logarithmic scale versus inverse temperature uh, um, results in a peak. And uh, from the slopes, you can get activation energies. And you already see here, there is an activation energy taken from the low temperature flank and an activation energy from the high temperature flank. And these activation energy uh, refer to different processes, either uh, long range or short range. And uh, in addition, the high temperature flank also tells you something about a dimensionality effects. This means uh, that if the diffusion pass way is, for example, two-dimensional uh, due to the structure of the solid, uh, this will result in a different slope and also in a different frequency dependence of the relaxation rate. Uh, low and um, uh, laboratory and rotating frame measurements mean you have completely different frequencies, about a factor of 1,000 different, and this uh, uh, will then uh, be uh, 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 will become apparent here on the high, frank, high temperature side. Um, well, a solid state. Uh, NMR, of course, also uh, tells you something about the local structure. And uh, the most uh, important uh, technique here is magic angle spinning. I think you very well know that. <clears throat> um, and, and uh, of course, also in the previous talk, or previous, we heard something about multi-quantum MRS, where can, you can get very detailed in, insight into the, in the structure. Uh, just a quick look at uh, one of our sp uh, spectrometers. Here is this uh, 600 megahertz uh, solid state NMR spectrometer in Hanover, which is uh, really a high end instrument with all the equipment necessary to do all these different, uh, uh, to apply all these different techniques. Just a brief word concerning beta NMR, beta radiation detected NMR. Uh, which uh, uses thermal neutrons, the capture of thermal neutrons, um, for example, by lithium-7, uh, produces lithium-8, which is a beta emitter, and this is indicated by these arrows here. And if you put this um, uh, sample with lithium-8 into a magnetic field, uh, you get a an, a, a symmetry of the counting rates of the beta particles, which is proportional to the polarization. And you may use this as a probe to study also NMR on highly diluted uh, nuclei. This is uh, possible for, with lithium-8, but also with fluorine-20. And here is uh, uh, a, uh, a photo of the um, instrument, which uh, unfortunately no, is no longer in use because the reactor in Jülich, where it was done, is, uh, was shut down. 
Uh, just a uh, uh, one word also, comp impedance spectroscopy. Uh, you measure uh, the uh, imagine, uh, you plot ima the imaginary part of the impedance or, uh, versus the real part. You get these arcs, and if you're lucky, you can uh, separate uh, bulk contributions and grain boundary diffusion. Um, uh, 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 grain boundary contribution, and uh, also in the in the plot of the real part versus frequency, you see these characteristic plateaus. Ah, uh, well, this is just an impedance spectrum, uh, the novel control we use, and also the temperature frequency range, and you see uh, this goes up to. Uh, Excuse me, it goes up to uh, 40 megahertz, which is already an NMR range. So you can uh, really um, um, cope or cover the, this uh, uh, range by two different techniques. Another point is uh, mechanochemical, our mechanochemical processes, which um, may be separated in homogeneous and heterogeneous ones, which are induced by high energy milling, and uh, which uh, leads to a reduction of crystallite sizes to the, nan to the nanometer scale. It uh, changes the local structure and uh, uh, leads to a dis redistribution of ions. And you also may really synthesize new compounds, phase pure new compounds, by uh, high energy ball milling, uh, the, which are either stable or matter stable. Uh, here is a, a review on this. And uh, if you remember, uh, uh, the contribution uh, by Alan Shatwick, uh, uh, in fact, use is this me uh, mechanical, um, mechano, um, uh, mechanical process of high energy ball milling. Now let's come to some case studies, and uh, probably I won't have the time to. Um, uh, go to all these studies which are, uh, which are listed here, but uh, just, let's just have a quick look at different aspects. First of all, very simple-minded uh, picture, uh, uh, simple defective solids, which is a really a simplistic view. Uh, you have a single or microcrystalline, and of course a defect, which is necessary for transport, uh, on the other hand, uh, this amorphous state, again here schematically shown by hard sphere models, and the nanocrystalline state, which is somehow a mixture of these two. You have uh, crystalline grains of the, with a diameter of the order of, let's say, 50 nanometers, and you have more or less disordered grain boundaries. And... Um, the question, of course, is whether these grain boundaries are preferred diffusion pathways for the ions. Uh, well, of course, you may uh, have a, a look at more realistic uh, solids. Here, for example, on the left is an intercalation compound, the glass, and this is a computer simulation uh, of a nanocrystalline metal. Um, here is a survey of uh, fluorine, uh, of lithium and fluorine ion conductors. Oh, we started, well, there are still others, but uh, divided in single phase and composite ones. And, uh, well, I shall briefly touch on these systems, um, depending on the time, of course and uh, also on uh, fluorine ion conductors. A very old example is uh, um, coming to first to the so-called electrode materials, which means either um, 
anodes or uh, cathodes. Uh, in fact, uh, LIC6, this intercalation compound, was very early studied uh, here in 87 by us with lithium-8. And uh, the relaxation rate plotted as inverse temperature already exhibits the, these characteristic peaks uh, for two different orientations of highly oriented pyrolytic graphite. And what you at once see that uh, on the high temperature flank, there is a field dependence. These are different magnetic fields. There's a field dependence, and this already tells you that diffusion here is low dimension, and we could show that it is, in fact, two-dimensional, as you, of course, expect. Um, uh, we later did uh, lithium-7 NMR uh, um, a few years ago uh, and uh, compared that with the lithium-8 results and also with quasi-elastic uh, uh, neutron scattering the results, and there's a very nice um, Arrhenius uh, um, uh, a straight line in an Arrhenius plot uh, where all these um, different results fit together. A very nice example is this one. Uh, this is uh, lithium silicate in this composition. And what you, in fact, here, see here is are three different well-defined diffusion processes. There is one a process at low temperatures, which is due to one-dimensional diffusion, and two processes due to three-dimensional diffusion, which are uh, slower ones, uh, slower. And uh, the one-dimensional diffusion uh, process uh, characteristically shows this, free, this uh, field of frequency dependence on the high temperature flank of the peak. And if you uh, study it carefully, you can uh, you see an, uh, that the activation energy is about, is, uh, corresponds to half the slope uh, of the low temperature flank, which is actually predicted by theory for a one-dimensional process. Whereas the three-dimensional processes don't show a frequency dependence on the high temperature side. So this is really a textbook example for uh, diffusion-induced uh, spin lattice relaxation uh, studied uh, on an, well, as an anode material. Um, well, just as a re tutorial remark again, uh, in the case of three-dimensional diffusion, you expect this symmetric peak. In the case of one-dimensional, uh, you uh, expect a, a smaller slope, uh, namely one half the slope of on the on the low temperature flank, and also the frequency dependence is very characteristic. No frequency dependence in three dimensional case, omega to the minus uh, one half uh, square root frequency dependence on uh, in the um, one dimensional case, and this is represented by this cover picture where you can discern really already this um, one-dimensional process in these channels of the structure. Um, very briefly, another example here, lithium-titanium oxide, where uh, the spin uh, uh, relaxation uh, first for x equal to zero, is, uh, indicates a slow process. And now if you add lithium uh, up to s uh, x equal to 3, uh, you get a shift of the peak, uh, of the, in particular here of the low temperature flank, to lower temperatures, which means diffusion is accelerated considerably. And uh, if also, you uh, may, um, from the exponent here in this description of the peak, this is a Lorenzian, uh, you also can, uh, for beta equal to 2, it uh, shows that it is uh, three-dimensional diffusion. Uh, uh, line narrowing indicated here. 
uh, NMR line narrowing, you see the shift uh, for x equal to 0, which is at just this here. And then if you uh, uh, add lithium, um, well, in, different, in two different ways, I want to go into in details, you, uh, you get uh, this uh, shift, which indicates this acceleration. Um, the diffusion coefficient and co uh, were also uh, measured by via conductivity measurement in, and by this spin alignment echo technique, SAE, and they all fit very nicely together. And here is this uh, huge increase in the diffusivity if you uh, add lithium and uh, you can even discern, because this uh, relies on the technique used here, you can even dis, uh, uh, di, um, uh, find out which pathway the lithium ions take. Um, uh, lithium titanium disulfide is another nice example where the spin alignment echo technique was established for for lithium, it was invented before by Spies in uh, Mainz for, for um, deuterons, and here it is transferred to, to lithium. Um, and uh, you see here the structure of lithium titanium disulfide, oh, excuse me, um, with uh, uh, the, the lithium is normally in octahedral position, but if this technique works, um, because um, this technique relies on the change of the quadrupolar frequency, then uh, uh, the, uh, the, the lithium should jump uh, intermediately to a tetragon position, which is here the pink. And uh, accordingly, the, uh, the decay function, the correlation function of the um, quadrupolar frequencies at time uh, zero and Tm, Tm is a mixing time, uh, this is described by this function and uh, this is very nicely uh, shown here and you can de deduce uh, the time between jumps, uh, in this case is this uh, one hundredth second. And so this proves that lithium takes indeed this way uh, uh, octahedral, tetrahedral, octahedral. Um, and uh, if you fit all, uh, put all the, the results by the different techniques, which is spin lattice relaxation in the laboratory frame, in the rotating frame, uh, motional narrowing, and spin alignment, you get this, very, uh, this straight line which is, tells you that indeed in this model system, which is really a model system, it's no longer a, a cathode material, uh, it's a, a model system, uh, one process over about 10 decades. Uh, well, you also may uh, um, uh, find out what the diffusion mechanism is. Uh, Maybe I don't uh, skip this. It's, it's just, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, octahedral, tetrahedral, octahedral position. And this uh, uh, agrees with calculations for uh, isostructural system. So now uh, the classical solid electrolyte model system is uh, lithium nitride and uh, very briefly there were a lot of studies on this system um, in the past and up to uh, well to some years ago and uh, you see there is also here for example the pulsed field gradient NMR which measures the, the, the long range transport um, and uh, spin alignment echo, which was, uh, measures slow motion, and even beta NMR was done on this at still slower motion, and all fit very, very nicely 
to a straight line in this Arrhenius plot. Um, this is a garnet, which is uh, at the moment a very uh, hot topic as the fast ion conductor uh, par excellence. And um, spinletta selection uh, shows these characteristic peaks with very low activation energies for lithium motion and uh, the jump rates and the diffusion coefficient put together in one plot again uh, show this uh, characteristic Arrhenius behavior. Uh, lithium niobate um, is a system we studied in detail by various techniques and uh, um, con uh, conductivity, uh, mass spectrometry, um, and NMR. And uh, in a single crystal um, or polycrystalline material, we get quite slow motion. By the way, this is uh, congruent lithium niobate. And uh, even slower motion uh, you get for this composition. Uh, in fact, we are also uh, interested in uh, very slow motion in order to really fund uh, to understand the fundamentals of diffusion process. You don't study only fast but also slow motions. Uh, if you ball mill lithium niobate, you come to nanocrystalline lithium niobate, and uh, you can also produce amorphous lithium niobate by various techniques. And here's a comparison of crystalline, nanocrystalline, and amorphous. Uh, you see uh, this motional narrowing curve for microcrystalline, uh, for nanocrystalline, milled for 16 hours. It shifted to, uh, to lower temperatures, which means faster diffusion, and even faster if you get to a, a completely amorphous sample, which is this, uh, these green, curve, uh, green points. Um, also, the conductivity was measured. He has plotted the conductivity times temperature versus inverse temperature. And you see, essentially, two groups. Um, Amorphous and nanocrystalline, which is an activation energy of 0.6 eV, and then higher activation energies for microcrystalline and single crystalline. In, and in this plot, um, you see that there is this group of fast lithium diffusion where nanocrystalline produced by ball milling is comparable to that of amorphous, amorphous lithium nitrate. Now, we also produced nanocrystalline um, lithium niobate by a different uh, preparation uh, method, sol gel. And uh, the, the, the grain sizes are similar, 27 nanometers in the nanogel uh, uh, sample and 23 about in the, in the ball mill sample. But the diffusion coefficients are completely different. And uh, the, the suspicion there was that this is due uh, that we have slower diffusion due to the absence of amorphous diffusion pathways in the sol gel prepared sample. And this is um, proved by TM. Uh, <coughs> Micrographs here on the left, <clears throat> the ball milled sample. Um, you have these grain boundaries uh, of a few nanometer, or maybe two nanometer uh, thickness, and practically no grain boundaries in the soil gel sample. And uh, this you can also see in, in NMR analysis. Um, we have a two-component NMR line in the, in the case of the ball mill sample. 
you see a broad contribution and the motionally narrowed contribution superimposed, whereas in the case of the soldier sample, uh, there is not a big difference between the two. Um, and if you just uh, plot the area fraction of the narrow line versus temperature, you see this uh, big difference in the, uh, the ball mill sample. Uh, you, have, you get an uh, increase in, uh, of, the, of the area fraction of the narrow lines with temperature, whereas it stays essentially constant or slightly increases only in the chemically or soil gel prepared sample. Um, lithium uh, uh, tantalate is, uh, of course, a very similar system. Alan already mentioned that in his talk. Uh, we also produced it by wall milling. And uh, the aspect here is uh, uh, very interesting. Comparing the different um, techniques, uh, namely activation energies obtained from DC, AC, and T1 measurements. And what you see here is that uh, this, this blue one is 1 over T1, at, measured at 78 megahertz. Uh, AC is this curve measured at about 1 megahertz, whereas DC, of course, at 0 megahertz, has a different activation energy, a higher one, so this is what the, the message I want to, uh, wanted to uh, tell you um, already before is that different method yields uh, 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 similar activation energies when measured at comparable frequencies. These are comparable frequencies or the other way around. They measure uh, different activation energy when measured at different frequencies. Um, yeah, this also was, uh, this uh, lithium titanate was published as a cover uh, paper. Here is a composite system, lithium fluoride, with, mixed with uh, alumina. And uh, again, we have the two component NMR line with fast diffusion, uh, lithium diffusion in the interfacial regions, as seen by these NMR lines. And the fraction, uh, the fraction of fast lithium uh, ions uh, increases here drastically with temperature. Um, this is a, again a very old example. Uh, we are now coming to the fluorides. Uh, first, uh, this one: uh, calcium fluoride, barium fluoride, strontium fluoride, single crystals, and this was an early beta NMR study. Uh, measuring on fluorine 20. Fluorine 20 lives 16 second, seconds. And what is plotted here is a quantity you obtain if you irradiate the resonance frequency of fluorine 20 in the crystal. Um, um, which is, which uh, normally, if you irradiate the radio frequency, uh, it, uh, if the power is, in, is sufficient, you get uh, um, uh, the, the magnetization is destroyed, and uh, you get uh, uh, the, the, the dip goes to zero. This was not the case. Uh, here is, is plotted. This uh, the relative number of fluorine 20 <coughs> with neighboring point effects because uh, fluorine 20 with neighboring point effects could not be saturated by the uh, NMR irradiation. So, and here is plotted versus temperature, and at low temperatures you have about 0.5, so half of the D, half of the fluorine. Uh, ions are, uh, uh, have uh, defects in their neighborhood. And now if you increase uh, the temperature, there is a step um, uh, near 80 uh, degree and another step near 
220 degree. And uh, um, it can be shown that this quantity uh, is related to the better lifetime and the mean residence time of the defect, which uh, uh, follows an exponential, an erroneous relation. And so uh, this 80k step um, can be ascribed to the recombination of Frankel pairs, various separations, uh, with various separations. Uh, and wh where does these Frankel pairs come from? You produce, in this case, fluorine 20 by the capture of polarized neutrons, uh, thermal neutrons. And uh, this is a very soft process, uh, but nevertheless, there will be a recoil. And the uh, energy imparted to the nuclei uh, of the order of 10 uh, of, of 100 EV or so. Um, and this is sufficient to displace the fluorine ions and uh, so and to produce Frankel pairs. And uh, the annealing step at 220 V ascribe with an activation energy of 0.6 EV to the migration of vacancies. Well, um, our present interest is, uh, for example, nanocrystalline calcium fluoride. And again, this, uh, uh, the two component NMR line um, at two different temperatures. Uh, you see there is only a little peak due to motion, uh, motionally narrowing uh, of fluorine 19. Um, and this increases with increasing temperature. And this would be the, well, um, a simplified picture of these uh, diffusion in the grain boundaries, which of course uh, have a lot of uh, defects, in particular vacancies. Um, if you mix calcium fluoride with barium fluoride, um, and both in the nanocrystalline uh, form, you see conductivity of calcium fluoride, conductivity of barium fluoride. And now if you mix these two, you get still an increase in the conductivity. There are these red points, one for milled for 32 hours, one milled for, for uh, 64 hours in different vials. But you see, there is a, a drastic increase in the, in the conductivity if you mix, if you go to a composite system. And uh, we compared this with a result uh, which was um, published by Joachim Meyer's group. It was a multi-layer system uh, published in 2000. And in fact, uh, the conductivity we arrive at by mixing uh, the nanocrystalline sample is even higher than this multilayer system. And uh, here is again a TEM. Uh, TEM images, you have uh, calcium fluoride grains of about uh, 20 nanometers uh, diameter embedded in um, in uh, barium fluoride based grains which are uh, considerably smaller. And uh, we also um, produced by um, mechanosynthesis this uh, uh, system barium calcium fluoride over the whole concentration range and you see, as expected, you see a maxim, the maximum in the conductivity uh, at equal uh, composition of calcium fluoride and barium fluoride for various temperatures. On the right-hand side, the activation energy is plotted. And here, about in this area, the activation energy has a minimum. Uh, my last example is uh, uh, barium lanthanum fluoride. 
And it was, again, possible to produce by mechanosynthesis this fluorine compound uh, even in, uh, in a range, in a miscibility gap, which was, is not accessible by a conventional synthesis. Uh, this is uh, between about x.7 to x.8 in this area. And here is a X-ray diffractor gum, which uh, shows uh, that uh, which all these lines can be attributed to, um, to the structure. If you do uh, NMR, now magic angle spin spinning NMR, which is, of course, uh, a structural study then, uh, you see, you see uh, essentially only one well-defined line uh, in for x up to about um, 0.5 or 0.6. But then, if you increase the lanthanum content, then the line, the NMR line, uh, consists of two components. And uh, it can be attributed, on the one hand, to the fluoride structure of uh, uh, barium fluoride, on, on the other hand, to the tyrosinide structure of lanthanum fluoride. So what we find here is the gradual change from the fluoride to the tyrosinide structure in this mechanically uh, uh, synthesized system. And here, this is shown in more detail uh, for for uh, for this uh, for this concentration range of lanthanum. And the conductivity uh, shows this behavior. Uh, there is there are conductivity maxima first in the at x equal to point four. This is a range which is conventionally accessible by synthesis. And then uh, a, a minimum at 0.75 here in, uh, in the uh, uh, mechanosynthesized sample, and which is accompanied by the largest activation energy. So, um, you see again here this transition from the, uh, from the fluoride structure to the tyrosinite structure. Uh, and here, this is only very small, uh, here uh, cannot, probably not seen from the back. This is um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the chemical shift versus X, where you have this uh, continuous behavior. Well. Let me come to the conclusions. I showed you diffusion studies on in uh, crystalline, nanocrystalline, and amorphous, uh, both lithium and fluorine conductors. And uh, the main techniques were NMR and impedance spectroscopies. In particular, and for NMR, we used the whole arsenal of techniques, microscopic ones, relaxation, spin alignment, echo, uh, exchange NMR. I, don't, I didn't show explicitly an example for this. Beta NMR. And macroscopic um, is uh, uh, field gradient NMR, either by static field or pulsed field gradient. And uh, these techniques allow us access to ion dynamics and diffusion of very different time scales and also length scales. And uh, this uh, is related, of course, to different activation energies. And this dynamic range covers up to about 10 decades. And you saw that there's partly a huge um, uh, enhancement, which is tunable by uh, various tricks, let's say, 
um, and, and you and this uh, way you may do uh, uh, tailor you may tailor um, uh, very, uh, very conductive materials uh, as compared to the micro crystalline counterparts. And uh, as a final remark, uh, lithium and increasingly also fluorine ion conductors are in fact hot topics. Um, and uh, not only for applications, it's for application it's evident in the case of lithium, uh, but we think also it's very attractive for fundamental studies. And interestingly, often these very simple systems uh, useful for fundamental studies uh, are uh, in, often also in the same time, at the same time, useful for battery applications. So there's, uh, there's some cross-fertilization uh, between fundamentals and applications. Well, I have to acknowledge uh, members of my group here on the left and uh, uh, cooperation partners here on the right. You see cooperation partners are in italics and Martin Wilkening, which was mentioned by uh, Alan, uh, uh, is now uh, in Graz and uh, so he is uh, maybe belongs maybe to the right side. And of course, I have to thank uh, um, the uh, uh, DFG, BMBF, uh, State of Lower Saxony, and uh, of course, I have to thank you for your attention. Could you please go back to that nice uh, electron transmission microscopy of a, a nanoparticle mm -hmm. in the, somewhere in the middle? Because I want to ask you something related with it. No, no, no. Lithium niobate. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, here, this one. You are mentioning that these amorphous layers, it's an intergrain layer, yes? Well, here it's a surface layer. It's no intergrain. Yeah, this, well, this, of course, is due to the preparation technique yes. for these for this TM okay. pictures. Yeah. Because, well, I, I'm making this point because I want to ask you something else. else. You get an intergrain amorphous layer if you have them aggregated, such as nanocrystals. Right. Now, it's known that the degree of aggregation depends a lot on preparation, and the best if you can have a self-aggregation. Have you been looking to this aspect and try to correlate with the changes in the uh, diffusivity or conductivity? Yeah, yeah. that's a good question. Uh, in the case of the samples for, for NMR, we did no further preparation. We, we just used the agglomerated powder. And uh, so we have an um, agglomeration of of um, of nanoparticles. So as grown. Yeah. But for the conductivity, yes. we pressed the sample okay. and uh, something like one gigapascal. Yes. And uh, measured the conductivity. And you saw from the various examples comparing yeah. the results, of course, by transferring the conductivity to a jump rate yes. uh, and so on, we got a nice agreement. So evidently, this does not influence the transport properties. Uh, the, the, the transport is uh, along these uh, interfacial air regions, and uh, this is uh, essentially not influenced uh, whether it is uh, pressed or something, uh, at least up to this pressure. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have two small questions. The first one is um, when you showed the huge difference between the conductivity of uh, crystalline and amorphous lithium niobate. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask the reason for that. Is 
because the higher mobility of lithium ions in the amorphous structure, or maybe there can be also other species moving? Yeah, what do you think? Um, well, cond you know, conductivity is a product of mobility times uh, defects, defect uh, numbers or defect concentration. And what we uh, sh uh, measured is, the, for example, the conductivity. So even if the mobility is essentially the same, the conductivity will increase uh, by orders of magnitude due to the increased uh, concentration of defects. So this might be the main reason. Um, uh, but of course you expect also uh, a difference in the mobility. Uh, maybe uh, uh, um, Bob can tell us more about the, the, uh, the potentials which may change if you have uh, these uh, defects. But, uh, of course, the number of defects is uh, uh, hugely increased. Very quickly, I have another question. Uh, when you showed the, the difference between the direct current and the um, AC conductivity in uh, lithium tantalate, yes. again, the slopes were very different. Yeah, uh, and, if you um, so you think that in these two different uh, frequency regimes, you are looking to different transport phenomena, or also in the DC regime you have huge problems with polarization, so maybe... No, 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 <laughs> no. no. this is subtracted. Mm -hmm. uh, you can easily explain this very by a picture. If you have long-range transport, the ions have to surmount all the hills. There are high hills, there are low hills, and Long-range transport, they have to, uh, have to pass the high hills. If you look at DC conductivity, uh, this is at uh, high frequencies, it is more or less a local motion, and this ion then can, can only have to su surpass a, 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 low, a, a low mountain, a low uh, hill. So this it, uh, gives you then a low activation energy. Local motion, uh, at meaning, uh, this means measuring at high frequencies, um, renders these, um, this, reduced, this reduced activation energies, 0.37, whereas DC are uh, higher activation energies. Okay, thank you. Could I just ask one yeah. general quick question? That's a yes or no. Or yeah. do you, and for a long time, they've talked about fluorine batteries. Do you think there'll ever be a fluorine battery? <laughs> well, this will, this will be a very long way, probably. It's just this, well, this, uh, uh, there are very few publications at the moment, and this, this was, uh, let me say, like just an appetizer for concerning fluorine, fluorine battery, batteries will, will not be in the near future, I don't think so, uh, because uh, recycling is a problem. Um, this, uh, for a battery to, to be uh, profitable to run, they have to have at least uh, thousands of cycles, and this is, uh, I think they demonstrated uh, just one cycle or two, I don't know, so, uh, before, uh, of course, the question beyond lithium batteries is an important question, but as I said, I think that lithium will, hold, will be, have the dominant role within at least the next decade, but of course people are looking for sodium, magnesium, and, and so on, and one of these trials is also fluoride. Thank you, Paul. I thank all the speakers for this final session. <laughs>